So, John, uh, welcome. Thanks so much uh, for talking with us. Oh, pleasure to be with you. And most people that are inspired by uh, Teilhard de Chardin are kind of spiritually oriented, and that might describe you as well, but you come from a very different world of statecraft, along with your co-author, David Ronsfeld. And so I'd like you to begin by just telling us your story as to um, how you uh, basically acquired the profession that you did and, and then how you encountered uh, Tehard in this very different context of strategy and, and uh, statecraft. I think I'll answer that in reverse order because I was exposed to Teilhard uh, before I uh, went into the military and uh, came down this path of uh, international security affairs uh, as, a, as a career. But uh, what I remember, having gone to a Catholic high school, I remember one of the readings in my French class was an excerpt from Teilhard's uh, L'Apparition de l'Homme, uh, The Appearance of Man, or better translated as The Emergence of Man. And that's the first time I, I saw the term uh, noosphere. And it struck me as, an, and this was 1968, so it was a, a very tumultuous uh, time. And, and in uh, The Appearance of Man, Teilhard's, uh, who wrote this in the middle 1950s, was pointing out that humanity had a choice between extinction and transformation. And I thought that was just such a powerful, powerful point. And as you'll, uh, we're all old enough here to remember 1968 as a very, very turbulent moment, not just in the United States, but in France and, and around the world. And it seemed to me that Teilhard offered uh, great hope uh, for us and, and suggested that uh, this third story that humankind brings to the world, the idea of a realm of the mind that succeeds the, the geosphere, the hot rock of, of the earth as it was formed, and then the biosphere when life emerged. And now the, the true purpose of, of existence is manifested in the, the rise of, of humans who can create a, a thinking circuit around the world, this noosphere, this third story. Of, of the world, and it offered the possibility of uh, transformation and of creating something of uh, great beauty and, and harmony, as opposed to what I remember in that same essay he called the mankind's uh, open sore, which was the notion of a constant conflict, that somehow we lived in an anarchic world where people did what they would, the strong did what they would, and the weak suffered what they must. And this always struck me as a very, very important alternative. Now, none of this uh, stopped me from uh, being interested in uh, international security matters and wanting to serve my own country, but to serve in a broader sense. And, uh, and so uh, my, my long path to, to make it short uh, was to uh, eventually into business. And I began to hang out with executives uh, who were interested in national security, but in a very hard-headed way, not politically right or left, just trying to figure out right from wrong. And so we, we came to believe in things like uh, arms reductions, and ending the nuclear arms race, and so I was uh, instrumental. My first public writings and speaking and television appearances were in support of uh, an initiative that in 1982 was put on the ballot in California to call for a nuclear freeze. That's, it's not a pacifist uh, sort of doctrine, just the idea that both the Russians and the Americans had enough nuclear weapons, should stop building more, and then think about start reducing them. And there was, uh, at the time, a Marine colonel, former Marine colonel by the name of Harold Willens, who kept looking over at me. I was in the bond business at the time, and he kept looking over at me at meetings and would say, you know, Arquilla, what, why are you in business? You're, you know, you're more suited to this, this other area. And that led me down a path to um, eventually getting a, a, a doctoral fellowship, a full fellowship at Stanford. And my professor there said to me, as Willen said, you know, Arquilla, you're a different sort of fellow you might not uh, fit in well in a traditional university. Uh, why don't you try the Rand Corporation? The only thing I knew about Rand Corporation was from the Stanley Kubrick film, 
of uh, Dr. Strangelove, where they called it the Bland Corporation. And uh, but as I found out more about Rand, I said these are these are my kind of people. And so I I, I went there and and I had the great good fortune to meet David Ronfeld, who was thinking about. Uh, the information revolution and how it would affect the way societies were organized. And uh, I, of course, am thinking more about security. And I had been working uh, one of a small uh, team of RAND analysts who was who were sent to uh, work with General Schwarzkopf during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And in the course of that work, I realized that the information advantage that we had over the Iraqis made for the possibility of a much less destructive kind of warfare and something that could, while disrupting, disarming the enemy, allow conflicts to be brought to very swift conclusion. So I come back from that and uh, I read a paper David has written about organization called Cyberocracy. And uh, as I thought about it, thought about it, I thought, my goodness, there's all kinds of applications for military and security affairs. So I walked over to his office and stood at the door and, and said, uh, David, I, I just you know, read your wonderful paper and I just have one word for you, cyber war. And so we were off to the races and uh, wrote an article almost 30 years ago now called uh, Cyber War is Coming. And the idea behind it is uh, from the Greek root word, uh, kibernon, to govern or to steer. It's not just about cyberspace, but it's about the use of information to uh, gain uh, a- advantage or deeper understanding. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean lots of shooting more. In fact, it can mean a lot less shooting, as we point out in our original uh, article. So that, that got me going, and, and that led us to look beyond uh, simple matters of social organization and armed conflict to the larger question of how the world was going to evolve. And we both realized, uh, David also did his doctoral work at, at Stanford, it, it led us both to re-examine and, and realize that classical notions of real politique, uh, which enshrined the whole business of hard power and the use of force when it's in one's interest, uh, were really leading mankind down a, a, a self-destructive path. And, and so uh, we came back to... Uh, Teilhard's ideas. Uh, David was familiar with Teilhard as well and uh, went with this idea of the newosphere as a foundation for what we came then to call neopolitik, uh, which is something based on this notion of mankind as a thinking circuit uniting the world and creating alternatives to classic power politics. Uh, which uh, Teilhard thought and, and we think is is really the path to extinction rather than transformation. So that that's really the the, the path that uh, has led uh, both of us for for many years and most recently in in our study whose story uh, wins, where we realize that it is the narrative, the the story about any situation, whether armed conflict or diplomatic dispute or commercial interaction. It is the story about that interaction that matters as much as anything else. And and the purest essence of information is contained in, in that narrative. And uh, so it, it seems to us the way ahead, uh, moving from power politics to neuro politik, uh, is uh, very much driven by the sense of what is our story about ourselves and, and the world. And And I think that's one of the reasons the United States has been having so much trouble since the end of the Cold War. We lost our story. Uh, The Cold War was a story about containment of aggression and deterrence of nuclear war. And uh, now we we don't quite know. Uh, President Biden just recently talked about the spread of of democracy. Well, that's hard. It's it's a certainly laudable goal, but it's hard to be consistent in its pursuit as we're certainly not asking for democracy in Saudi Arabia or Egypt or other places. And so instead of worrying about things like uh, economic structures and political regimes to look to the larger glimpses that humanity has given of this thinking circuit in in such things as the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the Helsinki Accords on Human Rights reached in 1975, things like the anti-personnel landmine 
uh, campaign for which uh, an, a non-governmental organization won a Nobel Prize. Uh, for groups like Greenpeace uh, stopping nuclear testing, uh, even in the face of uh, French covert operatives uh, blowing up their, their, their vessel in the South Pacific when, when they went out to uh, protest uh, atmospheric nuclear testing. So we, we hold on to those things. And at the same time, while, while we try to take a very positive uh, view of this path toward transformation, uh, we also take a fairly critical view of the dominant ideas about the world today. And, and those, you know, the first dominant idea is that Adam Smith's notions of the laissez-faire economic market system is the ultimate evolution of economics. We don't think so. And, and in part, it's, it's because uh, if you look at problems like the environment, clearly the market is not going to solve that. The self-interested profit motive is simply going to lead to more and more environmental degradation to the point that the planet is is greatly at at risk. Uh, the whole point that uh, we, we had a colleague at Rand in, in those days who later became head of the State Department policy planning staff, uh, Francis Fukuyama, and uh, and Frank uh, wrote a wonderful book called uh, The End of History and the Last Man. It was all about free markets and, and free peoples. And, uh, and we, we felt that uh, actually if you were looking at an end of history caused by those things, it was probably going to be more like extinction than transformation. He has since more or less retracted that, I believe, and, and gone beyond his own book in terms of in his, in his subsequent work. Don't you agree? I think that uh, if transformation is the right word, certainly Frank has undergone a, a transformation in his views that I think is in many ways very consistent with what uh, David and I have been uh, arguing for. So yeah, that's a, that's a very positive uh, uh, thing. Uh, but it, it, it seems that you know, whether he has been converted, his ideas remain dominant among the many in decision-making and, and uh, policy-making. And so uh, we have been swimming against a stream in the 20 plus years since we advanced the idea of Noah Politique and find that while there is uh, certainly a, an institute for Neopolitik over in uh, Russia today, of all places, and, and these ideas have uh, spread among uh, in, intellectuals in, in a number of places in Latin America and Western Europe as, as well, uh, in the United States we remain very, very much devoted to this older paradigm of the uh, Certainly, the, the, the free market uh, is, is something, uh, right? They use uh, the notion of socialism as a branding. You know, we're going to put this terrible brand on you as a, as a socialist. And, and New Politique does not call for any particular economic system. What it calls for is something that's uh, sustainable, regenerative, and equitable. The biggest problem with market economics is inequity. Uh, in, in the world, and, and a new politic approach is very much more uh, moving in the direction of, of equity. Um, also, the, the basic idea is about the importance of story. If you understand the other story, it's going to be a lot easier to avoid getting into conflict with that other party. Uh, too often we have absolutist views of our opponents as purely uh, uh, aggressive, looking for, quote, world domination. And so an absolutist looks at China's One Belt, One Road initiative and sees uh, a plan for global domination, whereas someone steeped in Noah Politik looks at it and says, ah, this is another way to knit the world together. And as a strategist, by the way, I, I, I say, well, look, it, it makes no sense for China to want to try to conquer vast areas because this, this Belt and Road Initiative is actually highly vulnerable to disruption at great economic cost to China. So it just it doesn't make sense to be suspicious of it as an engine of world uh, uh, conquest. Uh, the point being that uh, Nua Politik allows you to see the world through a different lens in a different way and to a different purpose. And if David and I have uh, contributed over the years in any meaningful way, and I think we have with the concepts of, of uh, cyber war and the notion of swarm, social swarms that can lead to revolutions uh, like the color revolutions or the Arab Spring, etc., big social movements. Uh, I, I think all of it can be knitted together under the, the rubric of uh, an emerging neopolitik. 
But this has the opposition of all the old ways of thinking, the habits of mind and institutional interests of those who hold power in many places in the world. And so uh, the movement forward uh, with uh, Newosphere building and the crafting of uh, Neopolitik as a form of uh, diplomacy in, in the world is something that's probably going to arise and be sustained more by mass publics and non-governmental organizations and the occasional forward-looking country. Well, I introduced you by saying how different it was that you know someone from the world of statecraft could be doing this uh, compared to people that are spiritually oriented. But then you reminded me that you know people that go into the military or to uh, defense and that sort of thing often are are motivated by the desire to serve. And um, and if you combine the desire to serve with uh, with a suitably holistic mindset, that story, then there you are. You've already got a path. So in, in both cases, you're more or less working to create something larger than your uh, larger than your yourself. So that has resolved that paradox for me. And another point I wanted to make is that um, uh, based on my own work and my colleagues about basically uh, creating a new paradigm for economics. Of course, you're right that the neoclassical market-driven paradigm is is uh, deeply, deeply flawed. But when we talk about socialism, uh, we find that it is flawed in another way, which is in the direction of centralized planning. And centralized planning cannot work for reasons that uh, Tehard would appreciate. Uh, in the first place, the world is too complex to be understood by any team of experts. And in the second place, socialism usually results in a concentration of power in the hands of a few elites, and then it fails for that for that reason. And so if, if centralized planning doesn't work and if laissez-faire doesn't work, what does? It's a managed process of cultural evolution, something more or less what Teilhard had in mind. And so uh, this is the kind of discourse that uh, we're having over on my end. And of course, it goes together so well with, uh, with um, what, you are, uh, what you are doing. Well, among other things, uh, uh, John, you're a great scholar of Teilhard. I learned a lot from you. And one thing you point out is that he was not the only one to be talking about the Noah sphere. There were two others, contemporaries uh, at the time, uh, Verdansky and uh, Leroy. Could you talk a little bit about their views? And, and this must indicate something about the times that three people were, were more or less thinking along the same uh, lines. And there's a, an important Russian influence here, always has been. Uh, you've also mentioned that there is a Noah sphere in, Institute um, in Russia. And so uh, tell us a little bit about the origin of the Noosphere concept in which Teilhard uh, was not the only founding person. This was a period after World War I in the 1920s uh, where uh, Teilhard had the good fortune to be interacting with Vernadsky and, and Leroy. And Vernadsky, of course, part of the you know, Soviet uh, ethos that is uh, emerging at the time. And, and there was in some quarters, uh, a great enthusiasm for the, the potential of uh, the, the communist uh, uh, model. And of course, you're right, central planning had problems from the very beginning. The new economic plan itself had to be put in place, which was uh, largely market reforms, had to be put in place in the 1920s. Uh, but to think about uh, these three sort of uh, interacting, just think about the sparks that had to fly when uh, they were engaging in a, in a discourse uh, uh, about the newosphere. And I think the really important point that comes out of uh, their, their discourse is this notion of uh, whether it could possibly occur smoothly, this development of the global thinking circuit, which Teilhard anticipates the technology that will do this. He couldn't have imagined the the internet and the World Wide Web itself, but he said one day there will be a technology that knits together all with all and they will be able to communicate uh, instantaneously. And, and that's pretty amazing for a guy thinking about this a hundred years ago. But the, the bigger question they asked themselves was, could this transformation of humankind into a thinking circuit rather than a group of scrabbling nations fighting with each over with each other over uh, scarce resources, 
They had just, again, witnessed this terrible cataclysm of World War I in which the leading powers and empires of the world dealt each other's sledgehammer blows. He was a stretcher bearer, as you know, in World War I. So not only did he lift you World War I, he was carting off the injured and dead bodies from the battlefield. And he has an amazing quote, which uh, uh, we can present about why the battlefield was so why the front was so captivating and why people, everyone there, wanted nothing more to, than to return to the front. Um, despite all the hardship and life-threatening dangers, there was, they were witnessing something at the front that was irresistibly attractive to them. And I, I sometimes imagine that geologically as these social tectonic forces were, were in play. I think that's how Teilhard imagined it. Um, also, that he was witnessing these these uh, you know tectonic cultural plates kind of colliding with each other, and then over the longer term towards some positive end, despite all of the amazing destruction and what appears to be the very opposite of of, of a progress towards towards um, more more harmony and and coordination. Well, this was the great hope, of of course, that World War I was the war to end all wars, uh, simply because it was so horrific. And the only way to make sense of it was the idea that this is the uh, last war. Uh, as to the enthusiasm for the front, it was somewhat mixed. In 1917, 100 French divisions mutinied most of the field force and refused to attack the enemy. And I take more heart in, in that, actually, than in the uh, massive artillery barrages and uh, uh, millions uh, mowed down by machine guns. The, uh, these hundred French divisions said, uh, actually, this slaughter is, is purposeless. And they, they said, our mutiny is conditional. We will uh, defend France if attacked, but there is no reason at this point to attack the Germans. And, uh, and certainly not with the terrible and very poor strategies that are being employed, which are these massed frontal attacks. So Teilhard was very busy carting wounded and, and dead away from the, uh, the front. Kind of an amusing anecdote about tectonic shift. It came a point they kept trying to break the trench deadlock on the Western Front, and a, a British general by the name of Plumer uh, decided to have uh, his sappers, his engineers, dig a, a, a deep tunnel uh, across no man's land and uh, under German lines and to stuff as much explosive as they possibly could in it. And, and when they finally detonated it, uh, this is in uh, near uh, Mons uh, where, where it went off, uh, and the uh, windows of Parliament in London rattled at the time of this. And uh, one of his subordinates went up to General Plumer and, and, and said, General, today you have changed uh, history. And he said, well, perhaps not history, but certainly some geography. And because uh, they'd blown up a, a quite substantial area. Uh, it, of course, didn't change the war. The advancing troops fell into a massive crater and they were decimated by artillery fire. And personally, I, I think it was the futility of that war that uh, got Vernadsky and Leroy and, and Teilhard uh, to raise up their eyes to the hills of, of the newosphere. And uh, even so, the experience of the war suggested to them that, uh, and, and of their own uh, discourse, uh, suggested to them that reaching that, that newosphere and developing what Ronfeldt and I would call neopolitik later on, uh, reaching that could take a, a terrible paroxysm, as I think the term that uh, Vernadsky uh, uh, used first uh, uh, among them. And... I, I hope that doesn't have to be the case. I, I don't think the future is uh, driven by uh, a deterministic uh, proclivity of humanity to uh, move to the edge of self-destruction before backing away. I, I think there's um, mounting evidence and, and much greater support uh, for something. And, and clearly in the United States, the desire to become less interventionist militarily in the world is uh, a very, very positive sign uh, emerging. We've done an interview with um, another Stanford colleague of yours, Josiah Ober, on classical Greece, where I learned that uh, actually classical Greece was preceded by a period of collapse, social collapse, that um, 
more or less eliminated palace level society and then democratic governance emerged from from that and i do think that this is often the case that um uh, that it takes a crisis or uh, of sorts basically to knock the social system into some other some other place on this very complex parameter space but that it doesn't need to happen that way and and of course the more we learn about cultural evolution the more we're able to um to manage it then we can arrange for soft landings rather than rather than some some um uh, uh crisis to just knock us someplace else and then and then climb our adaptive landscape from uh, from that but i'd like to focus on the concept of democracy john uh as to its role in the noosphere so uh, speak to us as you have in your paper as to uh, the importance of democratic governance in the formation of the uh, noosphere at any scale uh, because the noosphere i think when we think of it as like uh, you know a, a group level functional organization uh complete with a group mind uh then that can exist at many scales it can exist at the scale of a tiny hunter gatherer group which is what i take at what tehard meant when he talks about tiny grains of thought um current organizations like a corporation or a nation is a noosphere of sorts uh which might work well or poorly and then of course we're trying to expand that envelope to the uh globe so at all of these scales actually from the smallest to the largest uh, how do you see the role of democratic governance i think democracy is going to be essential to the further development of the new sphere and indeed to new politik and i want to draw a distinction here between democracy and republicanism what we think of as free societies today are almost all republics and uh this is it has proved problematic including in the united states uh c right mills talked about it in terms of the rise of a power elite uh many many others have have spoken to the the issue revel on how democracies perish uh, they become republics that are captured by narrow and powerful interests and uh, again i i think in in most democratic societies around the world you you see uh these these problems of whenever uh, government is representative in in one way or another it conveys power to those whose uh, own interest may be inimical to those of the the people in a in a larger sense and so i i think if there is to be a, a new sphere in a world of new politik in the future it will require the expansion of pure democracy Now today there's really only one country in the world that comes close to having pure democratic governance and that's Switzerland uh where they have at least four times a year public referenda on matters of uh, constitution or uh, legislative acts or policy initiatives plebiscites at at etc and uh and I think they have shown that uh, what's the country of what 7 or 8 million uh they've shown that you can do this with larger numbers. John Stuart Mill was a big fan of pure democracy. He saw the problems with republicanism as as well, representative democracy. And uh it 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 seems to me that his view and Rousseau's for that matter was that uh, who also favored pure democracy was that it can only done, be done in very small settings. But out here in California uh we do a lot of pure democracy we have lots of initiatives uh there are many many opportunities to uh move in the direction and we're considered one of the more progressive states in in the United States and one of the more open societies in in the world and and we have a pretty vibrant economy as uh, as well here of course silicon valley a, a sort of world leader in taking us uh, into the information age So I I think there are ways to expand pure democracy that would be uh the real strategic aim at at this point uh because as as we look at uh, here in the United States we like to say well we're the world's oldest democracy which uh I'm not sure is is quite true and depending on how you measure things you know as a slave republic from the beginning it's uh hard to uh, see ourselves as very high on the democratic scale uh but it 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 seems to me as as i look around the united states today i see a lot of the problems associated with re- representative uh, governance and not least uh, gerrymandering not least what the founding fathers called the power of faction 
uh, that would uh, drive uh, issues. And, and of course, uh, C. Wright Mills' uh, problem with power elites and, and or what uh, Bertram Gross later called uh, friendly fascism, uh, which, uh, again, is a, the smiling face of a democracy that is actually run by uh, handfuls of uh, very, very concentrated uh, corporate and uh, other forms of, of wealth. John, so I think, you know, the, the giant tech organizations that emerged from Silicon Valley are by no means immune to that uh, um, either, just to make a small point. But uh, but um, um, what you said is so uh, interesting, and I, it makes me want to ask you as someone who's such a good historian that, um, by my view, the um, the very concept of worldwide cooperation was unimaginable before, maybe even before the 19th century, that it was just nobody could really imagine the idea of of, uh, of uh, worldwide cooperation. The first expression in, in religion was the Baha'i faith, I believe, that um, a religion that could really span all previous uh, religions. So 19th century, uh, what do you think about that in terms of, and why was it that that idea was which I, I would say today, by the way, is, is is rapidly becoming the only thing that makes sense. Is was impossible to imagine until maybe even as late as the 19th century. What's your own view on that? Well, I think technology plays a large role uh, in this. You you see a lot in the New Thought movement in transcendentalism uh, as as well. These notions of uh, larger notions of uh, humanity becoming uh, unified around common values and norms of, of behavior. Uh, the telegraph was what uh, uh, Tom Standage called the Victorian Internet. And uh, the, the year after the American Civil War ends, there's a transatlantic cable. You can, you can now send a telegram between San Francisco and Hong Kong at, at this point. Of course, it doesn't go across the Pacific. It goes... Uh, 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 eastward across the, the world to get there, but you can now move information fairly quickly. People know what's going on uh, in far off places and they begin to care about it. Uh, people learn about the terrible depredations of King Leopold in the Belgian Congo and a civil society movement rises up to uh, curtail his, his abuses. Uh, the same sort of thing occurs in the 18, uh, late 1890s uh, when it's learned that the British are creating concentration camps for the, the Boers in, in South Africa, where a war is going on there. And uh, the Mothers of Britain, one of the early NGOs, uh, was able to uh, help force their government to reach a peace accord with the Boers, uh, the Vereniging Peace, peace Treaty. So the telegraph was, I think, one of the, the first ways that began to link. Uh, radio, of course, uh, helped. And, uh, and, and then as we move forward to things like direct broadcast satellite in the 1970s and 80s, this played a very big role in the end of the Cold War as uh, uh, broadcast satellite became, uh, a very, in Poland especially, became something of uh, a major conduit of, uh, of information about the larger world in, into Poland, I think led in, in large part to the mass movement of people to claim their own freedom. It's uh, Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia said, uh, behave as though you are free and soon you will be. And he understood uh, this notion of, of people power. And this is the same time at which um, Metcalf is coming out with his law. You know, we all know Moore's law about uh, computing power doubling every 18 months, but Metcalf's law is that the power of a network, including a social network, is the square of the number of interconnected nodes. And, and so... Uh, we see a lot of these social movements uh, uh, emerging, which are largely about uh, individual uh, uh, liberty, but with communitarian interest at the same time. So it, it seems to me that the technology of the information technologies of our time now make it actually uh, feasible to consider uh, alternative modes of, of governance much closer to ideas of, of pure democracy. And as you note, you know, big companies will still wield power, but it will pale next to uh, what uh, the robber barons kind of power they had in, in the 19th century or the multinationals even just a, a generation or two ago. And as far as the big tech companies, you know, where, where is their power really from? It's uh, if people realize the only power they have is from the commoditization of individual information. Uh, 
uh, individuals will be able to wield a very considerable uh, power over them. And even within their own ranks, we know that there are powerful movements such as at Google, where over a thousand of their uh, top engineers and, and analysts refused to be part of the uh, Pentagon Project Maven, which was about uh, data analytics to help make drone strikes uh, uh, more accurate and, and kill fewer innocent uh, uh, people. So I, I see the technology of our time as giving a boost to something that, as you rightly note, began to emerge in, in the 19th century. Uh, and as someone interested in technology, it, it, it seems to me that there is a progression in our visions that ranges from telegraph to radio to direct broadcast satellite to the connectivity of, of cyberspace that is moving hand in hand with the probability of uh, and the feasibility of, of Noosphere building and, and the rise of, of Neopolitik as well. Yeah, that's right, uh, John. And I think that it illustrates a theme that uh, runs throughout all of uh, this project, all the way into the biological realm uh, for such things as the evolution of the nervous system, which was required for multicellularity, for, for uh, example, is that basically governance and information go hand in hand, and that an increase in scale of governance requires an increase of scale of of um, of uh, information. Another point I'd like to make is that um, um, this bears upon uh, the work of Eleanor Ostrom and the core design principles that she identified for uh, typically small uh, groups managing their common pool of resources. And when you uh, when you uh, uh, inspect those core design principles, they have such to do to do with such things as as uh, equitable decision-making, monitoring agreed-upon behavior, transparency of behavior, so on and so forth, things which come comparably easily at a small scale, but uh, do not take place at all at a large scale until you get those increases in information. And so you've listed some of those in, in, in what you previously said, basically atrocities that could take place because nobody knew about them, and now they do. And so it was like you couldn't implement those core design principles at a larger scale without the the um, increases in the scale of information. And once you once you um, once you can, and then this governance really, in some ways, self organizes. I often avoid the use of the term self organizes, but there is something, and, and the idea that the noosphere is inevitable, uh, the omega point is inevitable. I usually speak against that. But there's, but there's um, something kind of inevitable about these things being set in motion, and and increasing in scale with the consequences uh, uh, of that. And it leads to something, John, that you emphasized in your paper with David, that um, this is going to end up being a kind of a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, process here. It's not going to be the case of just you know, the nations being the ones making the decisions. There's going to be all kinds of entities, uh, nonprofits, social movements, networks, not, um, and that's, I think, in part what's required for the core design principles. These are like, you know, the uh, members of the global village, basically, uh, a diverse membership of the global village, not just nation states, but others that are capable of acting and seeing and doing all of these things, uh, and therefore asserting their their rights, basically. Uh, so speak to us about this idea that that uh, this kind of multi-stakeholder uh, that you can without for, without formal governance, it's almost as if there's a a level of informal governance that can that can take place, and then and then formal mechanisms of governance could build upon uh, informal mechanisms, if I understand you correctly. Absolutely, and and I think you're you're quite right that we're looking at a, truly a present and near future in which um, networks and nations are going to engage in global governance together. And uh, it's interesting to me that uh, in uh, uh, L'Apparition de, de l'Homme, uh, Teilhard is writing long ago about this notion of humanity as a global network. And uh, the, the man was uh, so prescient. It's it's really just quite 
quite amazing. Uh, the way I look at it is in uh, uh, a kind of longer view, if I, if I may uh, share this thought. Um, most of history until about the year 1500 was of a world whose governance was entirely driven by empires. And around 1500, the first nation states began to form as a focus of loyalty and organizing principle, and that worked pretty well. And nations and empires largely were clashing with each other. Sometimes a nation became an empire. Sometimes nations fought empires, as early Britain did against the Spanish Empire, which was a global empire in the 16th century. But we, we see this, and we talked about World War I a little while ago. That was really a time when the empires dealt each other these terrible mortal blows. And while most of the world was under colonial control in 1900, by 2000, uh, very little of the world was under colonial control. So the nation state seems to have won decisively in this 500-year sort of Darwinian competition with empires. Uh, nation states were more effective, efficient, profitable, etc. Et but just as the empires are winking out of existence, the networks are rising. And, and I think the next 500 years is going to be a period in which we see the relationship between nation states and networks unfolding. And whether that will be conflictual, in, in many ways, 9-11, uh, the attacks on America signaled that there, a great war between nations and networks was about to uh, get underway. But we see also in things like the color revolutions, the Arab Spring, and, and many other social movements and uh, civil society movements, we see also the possibility of, of something uh, of a more harmonious uh, relationship emerging. And, and I think these decades now are going to set a tone for a pattern that will probably unfold over, over centuries. And uh, which will emerge is, uh, you know, I, I always go back to Teilhard saying, you know, you can take the path to extinction or to transformation. And my hope is, is that, uh, and certainly David and I in our, our work express a hope that we will see uh, transformation. And, and I think all uh, reasonable people would prefer that transformative uh, path than, than the one that is uh, clearly destructive of ourselves and, and the planet and uh, it's, you know, we're now learning more about Venus every day. And it, it appears that Venus wasn't always this molten uh, uh, rock, but something happened to it catastrophically to the environment that, that turned it that way. Or as we look to Mars, we know water and lakes uh, were abundant on that planet at, at one point. And, and now it's just a geosphere. And, and so I, I, I think there is a a future, a planetary future that is in our hands and to a great extent the path we take will be determined in, in the coming uh, uh, decades. I do need to take a moment here that uh, as uh, uh, people who are accessing this are probably going to uh, wonder uh, how the government uh, uh, puts up with someone like me and uh, so I have to give a public service announcement that the views expressed are mine alone and do not represent official policy. And as long as I say that, I'm on solid ground. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, God bless America for being that tolerant. And and, uh, and, and you're not alone, I think. I mean, one of the things that I got from your article is that, uh, that um, you know, a strong thread of, thread, I said, of, um, of uh, statecraft are people that are more or less like-minded and they, they, they really, they really see this. And um, am, I, am I right about that? Absolutely. You know, we have to remember that one of the great American strategists, Alfred Thayer Mahan, the uh, great apostle of sea power, talked about the importance of the global commons, that great uh, maritime highway of, of commerce that was going to bring prosperity throughout uh, the world. He had an absolutely uh, global vision. And, and it seems to me that that's a strand in military thought that has been repeated again and again. And one of my heroes is uh, General and later President Dwight Eisenhower. He made choices uh, back when, when he was president. There were, there were plans afoot to use our nuclear advantage to strike in preventive ways against both Russia and China to keep them from becoming uh, nuclear powers or threats. The absolutists all saw them strictly in terms of threat and Eisenhower, in a wonderful speech in 1954, said, I reject the idea of preventive war. We will defend ourselves. We will not destroy others. 
And uh, this was, you know, profoundly, profoundly important. And, and of course, his farewell speech to the nation upon leaving the presidency was to caution against the power elite of a military-industrial complex. Yeah, the military-industrial... Uh... Yeah, these, these voices have been very important in, in, in the military and, and still are. And, and uh, certainly, uh, I've been closely involved with uh, most of the, 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 the soldiers who have been at the uh, tip of the spear these last 20 years, our special operations community. And uh, these are people who love peace as, as uh, much as anyone on, on the planet and understand the futility of war uh, as well as, as anyone. And, and so uh, it is important to recognize uh, that very often it is from the military itself that one sees uh, uh, past the conflict to uh, what uh, the great strategist Liddell Hart said is the true purpose of strategy, to create an enduring and better peace. And uh, that is something for which we all strive. Well, let's talk more about the global commons, your concept of the global commons. And, and a point that I'd like to uh, begin with uh, to... I think that you'll agree with it, and you can you can say, is the necessity of a whole earth ethic. Unless we actually, if part of our story needs to be the recognition that it's the whole earth system that we need to be working towards, um, and um, and uh, if we don't do that, then uh, we're not going to get there. So 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 this story, in my life requires a whole earth ethic. I think that's what you mean by the global commons, but uh, I'd love to hear more about it in your own words. Absolutely. I, I think that's precisely the, the, the point to think of ourselves as, uh, you know, all seven billion of us humans as, uh, uh, if you will, individual cells of one great living organism. And, and I think that certainly was, was Teilhard's uh, view of humanity, the, the biosphere uh, that uh, grew from the uh, from the geosphere, and if we don't take such a view, uh, we risk the destruction of the biosphere. And and I think we we realize that many uh, realize that there's you know to some extent denialism uh, that's going on. But I, I think certainly among the scientific community, this this tie, this understanding that the whole system must be seen as integral in in nature. Uh, and and um, that, I think, is something that it's a view that cannot be reached or sustained if your fundamental paradigm is that of real politik, of hard power politics. You know, you're going to look at the high north, which is opening up more because of climate change, and you're going to see it in terms of territorial disputes and resource extraction uh, rather than as something that has to be treated with great, great care uh, lest uh, global consequences, uh, dire consequences, un unfold, and uh, and the same, I think, uh, Antarctica. We are, are a little better about uh, being less uh, territorially uh, and re resource competitive over uh, the, uh, the the high south, if I can call uh, uh, Antarctica that. So w we see these things. We we know that the world uh, is integral economically. 90% uh, of the goods uh, that people buy, enjoy, etc., are moved uh, by water and uh, often over great, great distances. And unless this commons is treated with tremendous uh, respect, uh, it's, uh, and, and that means in, in the military sphere, it's often, uh, this, this commons is often talked about in terms of areas where you can deny access to uh, others or to control. Uh, this truly has to be seen as a as a shared commons if the whole world system is to uh, continue to have any kind of economic uh, vi viability. So it's uh, and looking at the atmosphere, right? That's another commons that we need to think about. Um, orbit, what we call outer space, which is mostly in a low Earth type orbit. Uh, it's a commons where we have a treaty that speaks against the militarization and weaponization of space, and yet the realpolitik paradigm is uh, driving uh, many countries toward an arms race so that they can uh, uh, destroy or seize uh, satellites. And, and the problem there, of course, is with the commons is that 
if you begin a war in space, which would go against the treaty that we all have, virtually every nation has signed, if you do this, you will create debris fields that will orbit for decades and decades and really degrade the communications of the world overall. That's the ultimate tragedy of the commons to have done that. Absolutely. And, and there's, a, there's a deep commons as well in the roughly 400 fiber optic links at sea that move about 97% of all the information internationally in the world today. And, and yet, um, we, we have the example of, uh, of Russia developing uh, robotic uh, mini-submarines that can uh, go to the depths that their regular submarines can't. These things deploy from a regular submarine, and they're artificially intelligent and able to locate uh, where these fiber optic lines are and either to, uh, well, to some extent, they have an ability to tap into them to spy, uh, but they also have the ability to uh, destroy them. And, and it seems to me that is another of those things that's highly inimical to the interests of this notion of a whole connected Earth, of a, of a newosphere. And, and it seems to me that there is room for a kind of arms control that is behavior-based, uh, not just in terms of we're going to reduce the number of missiles. That's a structural basis of arms control. We need to move more in this area of behavior. And and we've seen, you know, to, to my mind, there there are examples of, of neopolitik in play in, in arms control with things like the chemical and biological weapons conventions where nearly 200 countries have all agreed they won't, they have most of them have the capacity to build chemical or biological weapons, yet they agree not to do so. And the world has been largely free. A uh, hundred years uh, plus ago in World War I, there was a lot of use of chemical weapons. Uh, since then, uh, chemical weapons used by militaries against other militaries have uh, very, very little of that. And in even just a small amount of the use of uh, chemical weapons against civilian populations, excluding, of course, the Holocaust, where they used a lot of uh, chemicals to exterminate uh, uh, people. But the fact of the matter is there are examples, hopeful examples, of behavioral-based controls. And the only way to protect the high commons, the deep commons, uh, the freedom of, of the seas and, and the effects, economic, environmental, and strategic, the only way to do this is through a neopolitik based form of of behavioral arms control. And I think that is a central challenge for statecraft today. Well, uh, John, a very fundamental distinction, which I think we all know about because it's so familiar and it is so fundamental that we experience it in our lives, especially at a small scale, uh, is the distinction between uh, dominance and reputation, that uh, the two paths to power. One is just sheer exercise of power, and the other is to cultivate a good reputation whereby power is bestowed upon you. And in order for reputational mechanisms to work, uh, there's an entire apparatus that needs to be in place. It's essentially a social control apparatus. Um, and, um, and once again, these are things that happen relatively easily at a small scale, although it's the signature human adaptation. The reason that our species is different from other primate species is because those mechanisms did, did evolve at a, an initially a tiny scale, those tiny grains of thought. And then those mechanisms, uh, um, again, increase, in, increase in, in scale. So the idea, for example, that a nation might, might, might advance its interest by cultivating a good reputation, by becoming an exemplar, a light upon the world, and so on, and, and so forth. I mean, that's not new at all. And with your historical um, uh, depth of understanding, I'd love, love to know as to how this very intuitive idea at a small scale that an agent becomes powerful and well-known and achieves high status by basically contributing to the common good um, uh, is uh, something, of course, that needs to be expanded still further. I think part of the no-sphere uh, is to to do exactly to establish that the mechanisms whereby people can succeed through cultivating a good reputation as opposed to the exercise of of raw power. But uh, what do you have to say about all of that? It's difficult to build reputation. It's very easy to lose reputation, 
Uh, it seems to me that's the fundamental equation. And, and I guess another thing I would say is that reputation is highly dependent upon a consistency between what is said and what is done. And so let, let, us, take the example, let us take the example of the United States in, uh, in recent decades. Um, in 1994, President Clinton established a national security strategy that he called based on engagement and enlargement of democracy, spreading democracy. And of course, George W. Bush used that as a springboard for saying we're, you know, we're going to invade Iraq to turn it into a democracy and that will make other democracies. Much of the rest of the world and a lot of the United States mass public and some people in defense like me said that's a very terrible idea and it is inconsistent with uh, our declaratory beliefs about democracy simply because uh, we're quite happy to work with authoritarians in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Egypt and, and elsewhere, as long as it's uh, in our interest. And, and so uh, reputation is, uh, you know, I, I think the United States has sullied its own reputation. Uh, I think uh, COVID-19 provided another of those opportunities to do some reputational repair, but vaccine nationalism uh, has I think gotten in in the way, and and it is uh, again, it's what I have seen has been a rail politic answer to COVID, in terms of the uh, the the hoarding of vaccines to the point of them spoiling, right? Um, millions and millions of of uh, doses uh, uh, spoiling rather than being shared, and a neospheric approach, a neopolitik approach, would have from the beginning mobilized societal resources in all the advanced countries to create as much of these mRNAs, whatever vaccine works, to create as much of these. This is the great global challenge, and it hasn't entirely slipped away from us yet. We can still reverse course, and it was good to see the European Union and, and the United States uh, in particular with President Biden suggesting the need to uh, get a billion uh, doses out uh, quickly. That begins to shift the dial a little bit away from vaccine uh, nationalism, but I think it's it, to me. I, I've looked at this response and seen ah, this is still the persistence of real politic thinking, and it's terribly short sighted, because well, I mean you know you, you're a better biologist than I am, uh, you, you know that biological security is integral in nature. It cannot be walled off, and if large parts of the world, if Delta spreads to the unvaccinated parts of the world it will make its way as will further mutations. And, and so it, it seems to me that in, in this case, a, a kind of neopolitik approach to uh, vaccine cooperation is not just an idealistic uh, point, it's actually the most pragmatic solution. And I think this is one of the ways we're going to see the newosphere gain more traction in the years to come as people realize, wait a minute, this is actually the more efficient, this is actually the more effective way to, uh, to, to operate. But our discussion here is about reputation. And, and, and again, I think it is important uh, to recognize that even a, a few missteps can destroy a good reputation that will then take decades, if not centuries, to, uh, to repair. And, and it seems to me that is one of the greatest tragedies of American foreign policy over the last uh, 30 years. And it's, uh, first of all, inconsistency. And, and second, simply the sheer amount of suffering caused uh, in places. You know, we've spent much of our military efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan and have created untold suffering in both of those countries. And to some extent, there was war contagion that then spread to uh, to, to Syria as 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 well, and it puts paid to the whole uh, of fallacy about solution through military force. A lot of people, and certainly in the world I inhabit, think that your reputation is cultivated by the size of your military. And uh, what we know from history is that big bloated militaries uh, often don't intimidate the people who have the more innovative ways of uh, of, of operating. You know, Rome was brought down by barbarian tribes who didn't even have countries and, and, and governments. Uh, and uh, the Mongols were outnumbered by, even though they were called hordes, it was simply the term for a military organizational unit, the Ordu, 
Uh, they were outnumbered in all their major battles, and yet and yet won them won them all. They were not intimidated by the the empires of of the day. So I think that the tie of reputation to hard power measures uh, is uh, less and less persuasive. And reputation building and sustaining can only be done through actions that reflect humanitarian values that aim at the sustainment, protection of the global commons and in seeing ourselves as part of this great global thinking uh, circuit. And and again, I I don't think this is simply altruistic or idealistic. I think it is actually the most pragmatic way to move forward in uh, statecraft. Well, I think, uh, John, that um, um, all of this is so scale independent. And I love taking big problems and shrinking them down to small problems and then expanding them expanding them back. On what you said about reputations being easy to lose and hard to gain, and especially hard to regain, uh, that's true at all scales. That's true for an individual as well. Uh, when they do something that uh, besmirches their reputation, then, then uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, it is possible at any scale for an agent to you know, genuinely commit to, to all of this and then walk the walk, that involves being transparent and so on and so forth, that uh, that a reputation actually can be restored uh, uh, quickly. It doesn't have to take hundreds of years or anything like that. It's based on events, basically, and it's based on on uh, walking the walk. And, and it, it's also based on how you look at it. And back, back to the story, that when we tell the story and we tell it with scientific authority, which we can, uh, then we more or less capture the intellectual and scientific high ground in which it all makes much more sense than against the background of other um, stories. So the narrative goes along with the, with the uh, action. Well, I want to cover, John, two more points with you at least. Uh, my next point has to do with the environment and such things as biodiversity. And it's here where I think Teilhard uh, is a little bit vague. It's hard to know where he stands. And, and, and so much of when we talk about this, including our own conversation, is human-centered and technology-centered, that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that at least some, ver- some people's version of the noosphere, including my own, leaves room for the rest of life. And Teilhard has this passage in Chapter 10 of The Future of future of man when he says, you know, he envisions a time when the entire earth is inhabited only by people and their domesticated plants and animals. It's not clear that he wants that or that he he sees that as a good thing. And in that sense, he was quite prophetic. Uh, but from our standpoint, as we work to create the noosphere, uh, what is, what what did, with your scholarship, I'd like to know, you know, what's the full sort of picture of what Teilhard thought about the rest of life on Earth, and what should we be thinking in terms of the importance of preserving uh, uh, all of the wonderful life forms that have evolved over so many hundreds of millions of years? Yeah, in The Appearance of Man, he talks about this problem as well, that most life forms have a period of flowering, of senescence, and then decay and extinction. And I I think the most hopeful thing uh, that he wrote about that is if if mankind figures out how to break that cycle for itself, it will necessarily bring other biological forms along with it and creates uh, an ability to to break the cycles of mass extinction. And uh, so I, I find him a little more hopeful uh, uh, on this. And in the future of man, of course, there are other biological forms there that over which man is the steward. And I, and I think his position is largely biblically driven by the notion of stewardship, that creation is, is that mankind's role is as the steward of, of nature. So I see him in a, in a somewhat more hopeful light uh, in, in, this, in this area. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we're seeing tremendous uh, extinction of species uh, every day, given the actions of uh, humankind, uh, particularly over the last two centuries of industrialization, and, uh, and and I think we are in a race between extinction and, and transformation, which is you know how Teilhard 
uh, uh, put the matter. So it is, uh, it's a near-run thing, and it will only play out over time, much as I think reputational issues for nations will as, as, as well. I, I agree with you that individuals can find redemption within their, within their lifetimes and, and maybe turn that around uh, fairly uh, uh, quickly in terms of years or a few uh, decades. I think the timeline for nation states is is much much longer. And when, for example, I think about the Middle East, uh, the very fact that the United States invaded and uh, basically destroyed Iraq as a modern nation state when when it uh, did invade in 2003 is uh, something that is going to tar uh, every American action for a very very long time to come. And it, it, if you are to reduce the time it takes to repair a reputation, it will only be reduced if the change in behavior is absolutely radical. If the United States stopped talking about spreading democracy wherever it wanted to, uh, or that it was the steward of a, a new global order, a new world order, uh, there would be a, have to be a wholesale change in behavior if we were to shorten the timeline. But the trajectory of the United States is is one in which its uh, reputation is uh, in very, very uh, sad disrepair. And the current path we're on, even with uh, some of the more conciliatory policies internationally that President Biden is, is seeking to pursue, uh, only the, the beginnings of, of a movement uh, back. And I, I come back to this point because I think it is absolutely essential to new sphere building and to the emergence of, of new politik. It is ironic that the United States is, I think, among the best positioned nations in the world to foster this perspective, this movement, and actually to accelerate the progress of humanity in this direction. And yet its actions have done most to uh, actually retard and uh, reverse uh, progress that, that has been made. And, and I find that a real tragic irony of American power in the world. Uh, you mentioned Switzerland as an exemplar. What about the Nordic nations or any other nations which you think are basically um, better exemplars of, um, of uh, no politics? Yeah, I, well, I think the, the, the Swiss goes, goes back to our point about uh, governance. And you know, they have shown that with the technology of our time, pure democracy as opposed to necessarily representative or republicanism uh, is is a viable option. Uh, one sees um, a, a little more uh, a movement in that direction in the Scandinavian countries. But again, I speak to California as a place where they really are trying to do a lot of uh, pure democratic processes. I think the Scandinavian countries uh, are especially attuned uh, to issues of the global commons, uh, Norway in particular, global maritime commercial power, but also they're all tied to the high north and understanding how this affects strategic affairs across the number of great powers. Even China says it has a, a role up in, in, in the Arctic. This is a great area of competition, but it also, as the Scandinavian countries, the Nordic countries have noted, is a, an area where the, one of the first great examples of global cooperation could come into play with protection of the environment of the high north, which then will have effects, beneficial effects, on the whole planet. And if, if we lose the high north, we will lose a lot of the uh, uh, littoral uh, areas, the coastal areas of, of the world, including places like Miami and, uh, and, and such. And, and so uh, the other point about the Nordic countries is that they are much more attuned to communitarian uh, uh, values. And, and so... Uh, there is something very interesting afoot there. I'm glad you brought them them up. I, I think they're uh, natural players in uh, uh, new politique. Yeah, we've said quite a bit about that. Uh, we've studied Norway at the Evolution Institute for a long time. And one point to be made back to power is that it's a very common social dynamic at all scales, that it's the less powerful agents of a community that are most um, basically base their actions on reputation because they don't have an alternative. I mean, if you're a relatively minor player on the world stage, what, what other choice do you have? And then to basically cultivate a good reputation and so on and so forth. The, uh, the, the, the real politic option is really not, not available uh, to you. You could even say that about early Christianity. 
and so on. So uh, there are some very general principles at play as to um, you know who endorses reputational mechanisms and so on. Well, John, there are some versions of the noosphere, or at least there are some versions of large-scale collective society that uh, many of us don't want. Certainly, we don't want what Nazi Germany represented. Uh, many of us don't want what China represents, maybe, um, um, uh, although you might have greater knowledge on that score than I. So how did Tehar distinguish between the, his conception of the noosphere and something like Nazi Germany, which, of course, was something he lived through? Uh, and how do we proceed, given forms of large-scale collective society, which is not democratic and which is highly manipulative and, and controlling and and so on. So uh, how would you address that issue? Well, I, I know that Teod had faith that the light would overcome the darkness of, of fascism. Of course, communism was still in, in full flower uh, at the time of his death in, in 1955, but uh, I'm positive in my own mind that uh, he felt that the, the, the light would uh, ultimately prevail. Uh, Vernadsky, of course, who came out of a Soviet system, was more attuned to the idea of this cataclysmic uh, uh, clash. And, uh, and you know, we, we know it from uh, scriptural readings. You know, there's an Armageddon in Christian theology as, as well as an ultimate climactic civilizational battle in, in uh, Muslim theology as, uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and of course, in the uh, Indian sacred texts, there are these cataclysmic struggles uh, described in, in the Mahabharata uh, and, and, and such. And, and so, you know, the question is whether this cycle will be repeated and in increasingly destructive ways or whether the cycle can be broken. And, and that, is, that is the challenge. And for David Ronfeldt and me, the cycle will not be broken if we remain within the realpolitik paradigm. Uh, that's not to say that, that neopolitik does away with these tensions. Uh, neopolitik exists and competes with realpolitik. And so Vernadsky and Leroy and, and Teilhard all anticipate the possibility of this uh, titanic clash be between the two. And, and I think you know, we're seeing some of that underway in, in the world uh, today al already. Uh, I prefer to see in the rise of civil society, of uh, the you know, efforts to build and sustain a global commons, and even in the system in which I inhabit, many believe in the importance of, of the global commons and the need that the American role is in many ways to help build that and to increase the practices of commoning uh, throughout the world. And, and I think that's a much better and more neospheric type task than trying to spread democracy. I have to tell you that governance systems mean a lot less to me. What, what matters are the, the larger questions of uh, the quality of, of human life and the protection of, of rights. And, and I think that uh, even in a democracy like the United States, uh, there are questions about human rights that are underway. You know, George Floyd is a sort of avatar of, of that that question and, and the movement to help resolve that, that question. And so uh, I, I really think w we have to live in a world as it is and respect that the currents of culture and history cannot and should not be altered by armed force and can only be better understood and dealt with on, on the basis of a, a, a new politic approach that is designed to identify common across regime types of governance, common interests of, of humanity. And we see this in areas like arms control, both structural nuclear and behavior-based chemical and, and biological. We see it in the worldwide revulsion toward terrorism. Uh, we see it in, in many different ways with uh, the rise of humanitarian assistance and disaster uh, relief. Uh, so let's consider those all, uh, you know, uh, poking holes in, in the darkness and, and creating uh, more room for, for light. And, uh, and again, it's, you know, it took 
it took 500 years for the nation state to supplant the, the empire. I think it's probably going to take 500 years for the noospherically oriented social networks, if not to supplant, at, at least uh, to transform uh, the nature of governance under nation state uh, structures. But I, I think what we view as today's nation states will probably be uh, much loosened as a form of governance in the, in the coming centuries. And if anything, what Teilhard leaves me with the most is uh, the sense of having to see ourselves as uh, individual cells in a, an organism that's now comprised of seven billion of us. Uh, we are stewards. Uh, we have a responsibility to both the geosphere and, and the biosphere that we must undertake. And, uh, you know, we, we will be replaced by other cells and, and hopefully if not our genes, at least our memes, our ideas can be transmitted to those new cells in that living thinking circuit and uh, will not only propagate, but will will increase. Uh, Robert Axelrod did a wonderful study many years ago called The Evolution of Cooperation. And uh, indeed, he uses biology as a leading metaphor in, in his work. And what he found is that even small areas of cooperative behavior tended in an evolutionary sense, and he was able to do this through computer runs of simulated systems, even small areas of cooperation were able to crowd out the darker, more conflictual uh, systems uh, over over time. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we we three are unlikely, and, and those living in the world now are unlikely to see the end point uh, but Teilhard was one who believed in the telos, the end of humanity, the purpose uh, in it. And that great purpose is to avoid the patterns of extinction and really to instantiate the pattern of transformation. Well, John, that's a great to, uh, note to end on. And uh, as for my own ending, I just, uh, I'm a great believer in the concept of catalysis for rates of cultural change in addition to rates of chemical change. And so uh, how long this will take in an optimistic sense it need not take centuries. I think actually it could take uh, could actually take place very substantially within our lifetimes if you really appreciate the concept of catalysis and apply it to rates of cultural uh, evolution. But of course, time will tell. So I think that this has been a wonderful um, um, conversation, John, and I, I'm, I'm so happy that we've captured it and that we could make this uh, widely, uh, widely available. And uh, your, your work is so brilliant, along with David Rosfeld. Uh, and so I'm so happy that you filled out this, this dimension of Tehard in, in the direction of you know, pragmatic uh, statecraft. Uh, the only thing that makes sense from the, uh, against the background of the correct story. So uh, thank you, John. Oh, it's been a, a great pleasure, and uh, I will uh, light a candle and say a prayer that you're right about the timeline of transformation. It would be uh, lovely, lovely to see it. <laughs>